Jesus, we praise you. Glory to your name, Lord. Glory to your name, Lord. Glory to your name, Jesus. Glory to your name, Jesus. Is 
what I need. Yes, I do, Lord. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what I long for. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, we need you to fill us with your spirit. We've come hungry, we've come empty, and we've come dry. We ask that you'd fill us, Lord. We're gathered together to have more of you, Jesus, to have an infusion of your power, Lord, the power of God. Mm -hmm. 
cover all the Holy Spirit. Bathe my trembling heart and brow. Fill me with thy hallowed presence. Come, oh, come and fill me now. Thou Canst fill me, gracious spirit, though I cannot tell thee how, but I need thee, I gravely need thee. Come.
cleanse Jesus cleanse us Lord fill us Lord fill us Lord fill us Lord cleanse us Lord fill us Lord lift up your voice and sing now fill me
Worship Him. Be filled with the Spirit. Worship Him. some of you have come here and there's people here from all over the world I really sense tonight standing on the platform that some of you have come here and man you are under the gun the devil has battered you bruised you beat you up and many of you are surprised you're even here because you took a beating and a lashing of the devil before you even got here and some of you now that you're here the devil's trying to really beat you up good but I've got good news for you friend that's <laughs> That's, that's a good indicator that God is working mightily in your life. That's an indicator. And I want to tell you something. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I want everybody standing. Everybody standing. Listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to blow the shofar. And I'll tell you what we're going to do. When we blow that shofar, I want you to lift your voices and blend it and harmonize with that shofar. And I want us to send us clear sound to hell that God is in the midst of this place. You know, in Israel, Many times Israel would blow the shofar as a sound to battle, a call to battle. I think tonight as we sound the shofar, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to sound it as a call to battle. We're not going to hang our harps on the willow. We're not going to sit around and cry. We're going to reach out, take up our sword, stand up, and march to the enemy's territory. <laughs>
sing one more song and I want to share a word with you a testimony before we sing it Stephen pastor I didn't even tell you guys about this and the, and the, I got a call today and uh, I have some friends visiting me join Kathy Holder from Florence Alabama you've been to Florence and there's a very prestigious Baptist Church in Florence and uh, I got word that Sunday night they had a breakout You're the pastor's wife? Were you there? Well, come here. Come here.
Now, what's your name? Laura Trapp. Laura Trapp. Now, your husband has had a, had a physical ailment. What, what is it? Um, he was diagnosed one year ago today with Lou Gehrig's disease. Tell us what happened Sunday night, what God did in his life. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, I'm so excited. Well, um, it, it's a long story, but I'll, I'll just tell you what happened Sunday night. We, a year ago, two years ago, we came to Revival for the first time. And our first service we walked in was, Honey, Where Are We From? That was the service we walked in on. <laughs> and my husband is a Southern Baptist pastor, and we were... Uh, we were really taken by surprise, you know, but we knew it was God. And, uh, and so we, you know, pro tried to process that. And, but it started a fire in my heart and my 14-year-old son's heart to come back. And a few months later, my son came and I came back with my parents. And uh, my 14-year-old son, who had walked down the aisle and been baptized, was saved that night. And he was so transformed. <laughs> He was so transformed. He went back to our church and our youth director said, you know, if I had any doubt about that revival down there, that it was real, he said, that life has shown me that is real. <laughs> he said he's so changed. He's so different. And uh, so my 14-year-old began praying on his knees every day for revival, fire to fall in our church. And I, I would peek in his... Uh, journal, I'd sneak and look, and he would say, you know, God, let revival fire fall in my youth group, let it fall in our church, and he began to stand in his room and ignoring the television, and I was still had a lot of carnality in me at that time, but he, uh, he would just wouldn't come out, he was back listening to praise music and reading the word, and so that was in 96, and uh, he prayed for a year, and last summer, 97, no, summer of 90. Seven, the Holy Spirit fell on our youth on a mission trip and just set them ablaze. And it was the prayers of that young man. So at the same time, as, uh, and my, my son and I really began praying for my husband because we knew if revival came in his life, real, a real move of God in a, in a new, fresh way, then it would fall in our church. And about the time we started really focusing our prayers on him, he started having difficulty with his speech and uh, went to the doctor. He thought he had a sinus infection. And in June, July of 97, within three days, they told us it was not a sinus infection, but it was uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, which is, from the world standards, completely incurable and usually fatal in one to four years. <clears throat> well, it's been a year, and uh, in that time, the Lord has used it. Um, the first two weeks, I got a letter from a little prophetic Baptist lady up in Tennessee, and she said, Dear Laura, God is going to use this Lou Gehrig scare to seal your husband in love as a pastor to his church and to seal his church to him in love. This sealing must take place before God comes in awesome power so the weaker members will not be lost. So we, uh, we took that as a word from the Lord and we, went, we cried out to the Lord for his healing but even more for revival to fall. And, to make a long story short, it has made a group of Baptist people who love their pastor desperately hungry for the power of God to fall. And, um, <clears throat> some of our members are here tonight, and we have about 60 coming in tonight at midnight. Our whole youth group and about 20 adults will be here for two nights. But um, so they started a 24-hour prayer chain immediately and out of love for their pastor, they began getting on their knees every day and many people, God started meeting them there and showing them sin and healing their marriages. Out of love for their pastor, he was getting them on their knees and then God started bringing revival and plowing the fallow ground. And in the year since he's had it, it hasn't regressed much. It has stayed right in his voice. His voice is very weak and his speech is very slurred, but he still preaches. With his weak little voice, he's been preaching some of Steve Hill's sermons, and he's preaching harder against sin. Andy Mark, is that true? <laughs> With his weak little voice, and uh, God is just still plowing. Well, last Sunday night, uh, Bill felt like it was time for the church to have a church-wide time of prayer. It's been progressing pretty fast. He's losing a lot of weight and is having difficulty eating now. And um, 
so we, Barbie and Terry Franklin were supposed to be there at a concert and uh, who we love dearly, and they came and they said, this ain't the same church it was two years ago, is it, when they were here? I said, no, God's doing the work. But, so we called a fast that day, and uh, it was to be a solemn assembly Sunday night, and Barbie and Terry shared for about an hour and a half. There was a great anointing on them, and then uh, our, one of our godly deacons who organized the prayer time had us move the four rows of chairs out of the front of the church because we have a multi-purpose building, and he had... Uh, began playing praise and worship music and folks began really entering in and worshiping the Lord and crying out to the Lord and humbling themselves before God and then he called groups in the church the, the deacons first and they anointed him with oil and prayed for him and and then the senior adults came and they he had them point and he said point yourselves like an arrow at the pastor and at the head of the arrow was one person who was to pray he said you cry out to the Lord first and then I want that person to pray. So each group took their turns and prayed for him. And the one at the head of the line would touch him. And uh, 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 the senior adults, then the, men, then the women came forward, then the men came forward, then the children came forward. And the Lord has really been falling on our children and our youth. And uh, the children began to weep and sob. And uh, they travailed. It was just so precious. and. And then my husband began to sob, and, and then the youth came, and they did the same, and then the college students did the same. Well, it was such a holy time. The presence of God was there. I never thought I'd have trouble standing up in our church, but I did that night. And after it was over, I know you want me to say Bill was instantly healed. He was not instantly healed. The symptoms are all still there. But we knew the Lord had heard us. And it broke out into a celebration. It's Terry first started, Terry Franklin started playing, playing enemies camp. Well, a bunch of children, one of our college students got up on the stage and started jumping. This is a traditional Southern Baptist church. <laughs> started jumping. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know. Then, uh... What else happened? Terry played another song and more people started jumping. The whole area that they cleared out was filled with people. Then they started playing the happy song. And, and one of my other, my second son, both of my two youngest sons have been saved and called into the ministry through this revival. And they're absolutely on fire. And so my 20 year old just, when the happy song started, he couldn't stand it. And these kids just started dancing. I mean, not just jumping, they were just dancing a jig. Just the whole place broke out into dancing. Older people were bouncing babies. It was just a 45, 50 minute just dancing spell of shouting and just rejoicing. And, and, it was good, wasn't it? <laughs> it was so awesome. And the presence of the Lord was there. And our adults, you know, our adults have been hearing because God's been falling on our youth and our children. And he's been falling on them through praise and worship. That's when God has been coming and touching these children. And they keep telling about it. And when they have the opportunity to lead the service, they talk about praise and the presence of the Lord. And the adults kind of were like, well, they saw what that meant Sunday night. And they entered in. And I, I, someone came up to me and said, did you ever think you'd break out into a sweat dance and it wasn't mine? I said, never. And they were just pouring sweat. <laughs> And um, so it was wonderful, and it, we got out, I got home about 11 o'clock, and I mean, you know, we were the one-hour church services, you know, always. But <clears throat> it's wonderful. The healing's coming too. That's on the way. The Lord's bringing revival. The healing will come, and uh, we are just—we know that, don't we, folks? That's—that's that's what I wanted you to tell about, because uh, you know it's wonderful that 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 God when that breaks breaks out, and I felt like we ought to sing happy song again tonight. I was about to sing that, and and. Uh, <laughs> And I just feel like that, that your testimony, I was going to share that myself because it's what I'd heard about it. And I'd heard that your husband felt like that God really touched him in that service. And we're believing with him that God is going to complete the healing in his body. Amen. How many believe that? God bless you.
But I wanted to sing Happy Song, and before I did it, I wanted to share that testimony because I feel like in the Lord that there are people here tonight that you're physically here. I know, I know of people who are here who are physically ill, but I also know of some of you here that are spiritually sick. You need God to touch you. And why do we sing songs like Happy Song? Well, it's a silly song. It's as silly as it can be. But when you think about the grace and the goodness of God, how can you keep your seat? I could sing a, I could dance a thousand miles. And I want to tell you, I grew up about 45 minutes from, my father's church is about 45 miles from that church. And I can't believe that happened there, I got to tell you. That is so wonderful. It's not, this is not an Assembly of God thing. This is not a Pentecostal thing. This is for whosoever will. Whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. Hallelujah! Because the Lord has saved us by his blood and made us free.
Hallelujah. Oh, bless the Lord. Whew. Sis, I can't tell you how much your testimony blessed me because my, uh, my roots are in the Southern Baptist Convention. Born and raised in the Southern Baptist Church. My dad was a deacon, sang in the choir. I was a heathen because I wanted to be. Had plenty of opportunities to be saved. The gospel was preached, but I chose to ignore it and just be lost. And, and to thank God, God saved me, though. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And I'm so glad God's not forgetting the Baptist, I'll tell you. <laughs> we Pentecostals, sometimes our heads get so big and we think we've got it all. And we point at other people and say, well, you don't have it, but we do. And uh, that's the greatest bunch of malarkey you've ever heard in your life, friend. None of us have a corner on God. God's God, and I'm telling you. You see, we've had Methodists baptizing people by immersion in this baptismal pool up here. And uh, Bill Bush just read me an email that he got, Pastor, the, the, the revival is known in the Vatican. He, he, got a, he has an email in his, in his possession right now from a group of Catholics that came here and they were trying to get into the service and Bill Bush, our chief usher, he felt led to get them in here. So he crowded them in and pushed people over and got them in here. And that same group of charismatic Catholics were in the Vatican for a charismatic conference over there and gave a report on what God did for them and what God is doing here at Brownsville. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And it's stuff like that, Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, Pentecostals, uh, we're beginning to lay aside some of these petty differences that we have. We're beginning to center in on Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God and the blessing of God. And I'm telling you, friends, I, 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 another reason uh, um, that I know that the end is near is not only because of that, uh, that these, uh, these people are coming together from different uh, religious persuasions, but God has restored or put into the Christian church the sound of the shofar. And the reason for that is that God's getting His church ready to be able to recognize that sound when it comes and Jesus is coming. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, when the last trump sounds, it's not going to be a brass instrument, and those are beautiful. It's going to be that instrument you just heard a moment ago, and God's getting our ear ready and attuned so that when it sounds, those of us that know God will recognize it in a heartbeat. Hallelujah. And just in case you're here tonight and you're wondering what we were doing, doing when we were jumping up and down, we were doing rapture practice. Because one of these nights we're going to jump up and we're not going to come down. I've been preaching almost 43 years, folks, and I want to tell you something. I've been telling folks Jesus was going to come from for all that time, and one of these days when I take off, I'm going to get about treetop level, and I'm going to turn around and say, Told y'all! Because he's coming. He's coming. Hallelujah. Well, you may be seated. Praise God. A lot of men with their hands up. Hold them up high. Hold them up just for a minute. Okay, there's no women here that's got a testimony tonight. <laughs> All right, I'll go back over this way. I'll see your brother back here. Yes, sir. Stand up, brother, in the blue shirt. You a pastor? You a pastor? How you doing? Fine, fine, thank you. Where are you from? New Jersey. Where? New Jersey. That's what I thought you said. Yeah. <laughs> Where's that at? Uh, New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey. New ah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Down here we say New Jersey. <laughs> you say New Jersey. How, how'd you say it again? New Jersey. Yeah. That's what I thought you said. What, what's God done for you? Huh? Okay. Eh, necesito traducción para, para poder expresar bien lo que el Señor ha hecho con nosotros. Well yeah. 
pero realmente nuestra iglesia, yo soy pastor de las asambleas de Dios en la ciudad de Camden, New Jersey, la, la ciudad más pobre de New Jersey. I'm a pastor in the city of Camden, one of the poorest cities in, Cam in New Jersey. Pero el, el día 2 de septiembre de 1997, vino un, el, el pastor de los jóvenes acá. Um, of August of, September 2nd, 1997, the youth pastor came here to Brownsville. Cuando fue allá, llegó con el fuego de Dios y yo vi que el Señor lo usó. Entonces yo vine con mi iglesia. Um, when he came down back to um, Camden, he came on fire and the pastor came down to see what was happening here. This is the pastor? Yes. So he came down to see what was happening. Exactly. <laughs> Cuando llegué aquí, el Señor me, me ministró a través del hermano Esteban y me dio una profecía que el Señor iba a usar a nuestra iglesia para aprender el avivamiento en el este. When, um... When I came here, um, there was a prophecy, and God told him that um, the God was going to use our church to help spread the uh, revival in the eastern part. Eso es lo que ha pasado. And that's what is happening. Nuestra iglesia actualmente, de septiembre para acá, se han añadido más de 300 nuevos miembros. From September on, our church has gained more than 300 members. What, what's causing all the growth? El único que está haciendo el cambio es el mover del Espíritu Santo de Dios. The only thing that's doing the change is the power of God. El mensaje nuestro es el mensaje de ustedes. Hay que tener santidad, humillación y hambre de Dios. Our message is the same the one that you have. We have to have hunger, humility, and, and holiness. En esta noche hay un hombre aquí que es testigo que el poder del Espíritu Santo es la diferencia. There's a man here tonight that's a witness of the power of the Holy Ghost. Él era el 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 líder más grande de la ciudad de Camden en asunto de droga y de mafia. He was the leader, one of the biggest leaders of drugs and um and things of that sort in Camden. Él tenía un club y cuando pasaba por la iglesia, él veía la iglesia llena y su club vacío. Wow, he saw when we were having services, he had owned the club and when there was church, the club was empty. Y él dijo, yo voy a ver qué pasa en esa iglesia, ¿por qué mi club si yo llevo los artistas más grandes, los artistas más caros y mi club está vacío y esta iglesia está llena? He would bring the, the big stars and he said that um, I bring the biggest stars and um, my club is empty, the church is full. Cuando fue a ver lo que pasaba, fue con cinco hombres grandes, su guardaespaldas, sus cinco galden. When he came to church, he came with five huge bodyguards. El Espíritu Santo me dijo, me, me hizo que lo llamara para que orara por ellos, por los cinco. The Holy Ghost told me to call them and pray for all five of them. Cuando oré por ellos, los cinco cayeron al piso. When I prayed for them, all five fell down. Now, who is this son? I'm, I'm his son, the, the youngest son. I, I know you are, but I mean, who's this? Oh, that's um, the owner of the club. This is the owner of the club. <laughs> it's just the ex owner that is. Yeah. How long ago was it that he owned this club? Um, let me ask him. How long did you send him to the club? Like seven months ago. Um, he has been a Christian for seven months since it's been that long since he used to own the club. Is that right? God bless you. All right, Pastor. You was drawing more people on Sunday night than the club. Is that right? 
Yo tenía mucho más gente en la, en la iglesia que el club y eso fue lo que él le llamó la atención para ir a la iglesia. There were more people at church than at the club and that's why he came along to church. I think it's time that the church began to draw more than the clubs. Amen. I think it's time. Friend, listen, I've got a feeling, I've got a feeling that there's not enough churches in America. I believe that the churches in America are about to fill up and there won't be enough to hold America. I really believe that. Y quiero decirle que ahora la profecía es tip que tú medites por el Espíritu se está cumpliendo. El Señor está usando nuestra iglesia para aprender el avivamiento en el este. Todos los meses en diferentes partes del este hay una concentración de avivamiento y yo soy el predicador oficial. I want to thank Brother Steve for the prophecy that he gave that um, our church was going to begin with a revival in the east and we have a concentration of every month, every month for revival services where our pastor here preaches and the Lord is moving mightily. Eso es lo y, y, y tengo invitaciones para, para Venezuela, Guatemala, México y diferentes partes. Para el, el Señor me ha dicho que yo voy a soplar el avivamiento. The Lord has taught us to go to Guatemala and all the South Central countries to help spread the news of revival and spread the fire. Well, tell me about, tell me about this guy here. Tell me about the club owner. How's he doing? How's he doing? Um, he's doing fine. He's um, he follows the pastor wherever where he goes to preach. Do what? He follows the pastor wherever he does. Follows the pastor. Um, ¿Usted tiene algo para decir? Sí. Sí. Diga. What do you want to say to this crowd? ¿Cómo te le quieres decir a la gente? Yo le doy gracias a Dios porque Dios me ha librado de muchas cosas. Yo era uno de los de los de los diles, de las drogas, yo era uno que llevaba y venía aquí a Miami a buscar la droga y la repartía allí en New Jersey y yo le doy gracias a Dios porque me ha sacado de eso. Um, I thank God I was um, a very large drug dealer in Camden. I would come here to Miami to get the drugs and I would distribute them throughout Camden. And I thank God that I'm a changed man. Yo le doy gracias a Dios. Yo cuando me entregué al Señor, yo tenía de toda clase de alma, yo tenía ametralladora, yo tenía chacón, yo tenía 38, yo tenía 9 milímetros, y gracias a Dios, donde que vine para el Señor, yo la tiré para el mal. Hmm. When I, before I converted, I had all type of guns, I had Uzis, whatever you want to call them, and when I converted, they're all at the bottom of the sea. Yo le doy gracias a Dios, porque había mucha gente, yo tenía muchos puntos de droga. Yo era en Cande, en Nueva York, en Boston, en mucha parte de Estados Unidos. Yo era uno de los que tenía mucha gente por donde quiera vendiendo droga. Y gracias a Dios, ahora yo le predico a los, a los, a los hermanos, ahora yo le predico la palabra de Dios. I had many um, spots where, you, where I had people some drugs in New, New Jersey, New York, and many other states. But now, in Boston, but now I preach to them all. Por eso yo le doy gracias a Dios, porque Dios me ha sacado de eso. Y yo sé que Dios ha tenido mucha misericordia conmigo y con mi familia. Y aquí estamos mi familia, mi esposa, mis hijos. Estamos sirviendo al Señor. Y le doy gracias a Dios que Él también ha salvado a toda mi familia y mis hijos. Y están aquí conmigo. ¿Están aquí? Bien. 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 Have your family come down here and join you real quick. Come, come down here. Um, adios, adios, come down, bravo, bravo, bravo. <laughs> okay. Y'all heard that, didn't you? Uh, Y'all come on down here. To have the family come down here. Show y'all what I can do, I'll tell you right now. <clears throat> yeah. Él, él, él va a decir lo, lo que pasaba cuando él pasaba frente a la iglesia los viernes. He's going to say what used to happen when he used to pass by the church on Friday nights. Yeah, tell us about that. Yo una vez le pregunté a Dios y le dije, Dios, 
tú me has querido a, a mí mucho, tú has tenido mucha misericordia de mí. Allí en Nueva York, una vez a mí me dieron un tiro, y yo le estaba preguntando a Dios, Dios, ¿cuántas veces tú me has salvado la vida? Y Dios me dijo a mí, cuando tú ibas a hacer aquel negocio, tú ibas a vender 10 kilos, a ti te iban a quitar la vida, y yo a ti te salvé de eso. He's, he used to pass by one on a Friday night, and he said, God, you have had so much mercy on me. How many times have you saved my life? He said, um, that um, last time you went to New York, we were going to do that business, um, I saved your life right then and then. The Lord told him he saved his life right then and there. Mm -hmm. Y, y yo le digo a, a la persona que hay aquí, yo tenía un club que se llamaba Casa Blanca en New Jersey. Y yo siempre traía a los artistas, los artistas que más vendían discos, yo los llevaba a la discoteca. Pero yo pasaba por la iglesia y nadie iba a la discoteca. Y cuando yo pasaba por la iglesia, yo veía la, 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 la iglesia llena de gente. Y como algo me llamaba, algo me llamaba, entra, entra, hasta que me decidí y entré. He would bring on the hardest selling records of, of um whatever artists that were happening at that time. And then he would, he, nobody would be in the club, and then when he would pass by the church, he felt something calling him until he finally went in. Y cuando yo me decidí de entrar, nosotros andaban, andaban cinco goles para conmigo, nosotros dejamos la pistola dentro, dentro del carro, y entramos, y ahí el Señor me tocó. When I went in with all my five bodyguards, we left our like, guns in the car. Wait a minute now, let me get this straight. You went to church with five bodyguards. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pastor, I would imagine when you saw him coming through the door with five bodyguards, you thought you was dead, didn't you? <laughs> he, he understood that talk. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, but we mean the, 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 the big bodyguard, the, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Brother, what happened to your bodyguards? Los amigos míos, ellos están ahí, pero ya ellos están tocados por el Espíritu Santo. Yo siempre les predico, ellos están huyendo la salvación, pero nosotros estamos reclamando por ellos. We're praying for them. They have heard the word, and God's working with them. What happened to the club? El club, yo me dije, hice de él y agarré la bebida, la vendimos. Toda la bebida habían más de diez mil dólares de bebida y la dimos por dos mil pesos. I had around ten grand in um liquor and I sold it for 2000 everything else was sold sold the club sold the club now see I'm glad to hear that because it would have been discouraging after God did what he did for you for you to continue to operate that club a clean break that's the way to do it a clean break God bless you what you listen God doesn't save us in our sins he saves us from our sins and uh, let me ask you this what do you think you're going to do with your life now yo ahora le voy a dar mi vida a Dios y entera le voy a dar mi vida a Dios me voy a dedicar yo le he dicho al pastor que cuando quiera que él va que no me deje que yo le con él I'm going to dedicate my life to the Lord that has said, told the Lord that wherever, everywhere my pastor will go I will go let me ask you this out of all the people you knew in the world can you understand me? yeah out of all the people that you knew in the world out of all the people you rub shoulders with What makes this man of God different? What makes church different? La diferencia de Dios era, la diferencia es que yo de antes tenía que andar con mucha alma, tenía que, yo vivía en un sitio que nadie sabía dónde yo vivía, porque yo siempre andaba, yo tenía un carro, yo andaba en un carro, y cuando iba para mi casa yo lo cambiaba. La diferencia ahora, que yo no tengo miedo ni temo a nada en el mundo. What do you say, man? Woo! Yeah. The difference is I don't have to carry any guns no more. Um, before I used to have to drive a different a car, a different car home, and I used to have to drive a different car back, so no one would recognize me ever. And now, and now I don't fear anything. Reggie, yeah. might make a preacher. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> Give these folks a big hand, will you? God bless you. Let's stand together, folks.
Did you feel that? There is an anointing. I said there is an anointing. When a pastor shares, some of you still don't understand it. See, when he, I am so tired of um, handing people tracks. And this is what I've done for years. Now, we've seen results all over the world. But when you hand people tracks, they go, oh, no, I don't want anything to do with that, you know, type of stuff. But the difference in this anointing is the power is coming down. And we're watching people that are not interested suddenly are hit by the power of God. Friend, it's like Saul of Tarsus. I want you to hear me good. Saul of Tarsus was not interested. If you had walked up to Saul of Tarsus with a track, he'd have thrown you in prison. I don't care how beautiful it was. I don't care if it said this was your life or whatever the track was. He'd have thrown you in prison. What Saul needed was the power to come down. The power. What America needs, because see, they've seen it on television, they've heard it on radio, they've seen it, they've heard it. America needs the power to come down. And when the power comes down, look what happens. He has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse across this land. He has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse all across this land. He's calling out to you and me. Will you ride with me? Hand. He's riding a white horse all across his land. He's calling out to you and me. Will you ride with me? Will you ride with me? We say yes, Lord. We'll ride with you. And we say yes, Lord.
be with him right by his side. There's a fire in his eyes, and it's burning desire that is bright you with him right by his side. He's calling out to us. Will you ride with me? He is calling out to you today. Will you ride? We say yes. thanking him period for what that you can speak that's enough thank him right now we thank you Lord we thank you Lord I thank you Lord I thank you Jesus thank you Lord thank you Lord worthy is the Lamb of God worthy is the Lamb of God worthy is the Lord want everyone to remain standing if you would those of you at home please stand to your feet we welcome everyone tonight to this Thursday night meeting every meeting is different everyone has its own every every service has its own characteristics God has a plan tonight and um, I have learned how to receive from the Lord in many many ways uh, everyone in this room, uh, I would encourage you to begin opening up your heart to receive from the Lord from everywhere, everyone. God can speak to you through a child. Maybe you're waiting for the sermon tonight, but God already wanted to speak to you through a song, through a testimony. Maybe he already wanted to do a major work in your life, but you waited for a specific, well, I'm going to wait for the message. I hope this message is for me. And it will be, but maybe that testimony that was just shared was for you. I, I want to tell you, if I was a discouraged pastor and I heard that, here's a man, comes down, God touches him, 300 people grow, that's, that's incredible growth in a year, friend. I don't care where you're at, where you're from, especially in the Northeast. That's awesome growth in any church. And so I would take courage, you know, encouragement from that and go, well, you know, God's no respecter of persons. If he can do that in the East, he can do that in the West, Midwest, down South, and the North. He can do that for me. So receive from the Lord. We're going to pray together in just a second. We got this um, fax in. I wanted to read it to you. I'm going to change the name on it. There's two names I got to change. It says, to the congregation and pastor, that's us. Um, I am just going to call her Lucy. I'm not going to give her a whole name. I'm presently incarcerated in the Escambia County Jail. That's a local jail writing to personally apologize to the church. Now, Lucy, if you're watching this broadcast at the jail, you know I've changed your name. I've done that for your own protection and for your own privacy. I'm writing this personally to apologize to the church. I was a prostitute for 17 years. 
Many days and nights I stood across the streets from this church and picked up Johns or tricks, turned tricks. She picked up clients, got in and out of cars right out front in front of this church. On July 6, 1998, this is just a few weeks ago, I was sentenced to 11 months and 15 days for prostitution. I have now made a decision to turn my life around. I'm not going to share the judge's name. I'll call him Judge Smith. Judge Smith stated to me upon my sentencing that the reason for giving me the maximum sentence allowed for the charge of prostitution was because of the Brownsville Church and the worldwide attraction that revival has brought to the area. And the judge was just ashamed that she was turning tricks in front of the church. He offered a solution for the church, but no solution to keep me off the streets, but to throw me in jail. Here's the good part. I am crying out for help. Could you please send someone from your church to visit me and minister the good news about Jesus? I really... I really need someone to pray with me and help me with the cleansing of my soul. I would much appreciate it if you would read my letter in your next revival. That's why I'm doing this. I would appreciate it because she wants forgiveness. She wants forgiveness for turning tricks in front of this revival. I want you to read this letter in your next revival and pray for my deliverance. Hopefully I will be going back before the judge soon for a reduction of my sentence so I can go home to my family. And by the way, we sent someone up there, and she was saved. <clears throat> so I want everyone to, uh, as a matter of fact, I got a feeling she's watching. And um, I'm going to go ahead and give her name. Her name's Janet. I want you to turn towards this camera. Everyone turn towards this camera. And we're going to pray for you, Janet. And I, I know you're watching. I know you're watching. And there are thousands of people praying for you right now. But let me tell you something, Janet. I want you to listen to me good. We can't change you. And God can't change you unless you want to be changed. He is not going to hogtie you and force you to change. You're going to have to want it in your heart. Now, you've asked the Lord to come into your life, Janet, and we bless God for that. But the next step is the commitment you made to him. Should the judge allow you a lighter sentence and you get out, that's when the rubber meets the road. That's when you stick to that commitment. And here's what I'm telling you, Janet. I want to see you at this revival. And instead of you being outside turning tricks, I want you inside worshiping Jesus. We're going to pray for you. I want everyone, and as I'm praying, as I'm praying, I want you to just span the audience. I want everyone just to point this way, and he's going to just turn this camera. Jesus, right now, everyone pray. We pray for Janet. We pray, Lord God, that you would get a hold of her in a way that she has never experienced before. Move in her life. Move in her life. Holy Ghost, God, get everything out. Every sin out, Jesus. Set her free. There is deliverance in the name of Jesus. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. Set her free. 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 In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Everyone standing, I want you to pray with me a prayer we've been praying since Father's Day. We've been asking the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. There's someone within the sound of my voice before we pray this. You had better make up your mind who you're going to serve. As an evangelist, I've, I've got patience. God knows I've got patience. But the patience God must have is unbelievable 
because I get irritated with people. I want everyone to look this way before we pray. People that cannot make up their mind. I mean, you can pull up to a Burger King and you can order a Whopper with extra cheese and extra pickles and ketchup. You know, just what you want. But when it comes to serving God, you are so fickle. One day you're in, the next day you're out. One day you're in, the next day you're out. Things don't go your way, you backslide for a few days. The devil beats you up, so you come running back to God. And it's been like that for years. And you carry this long, drawn-out face. Woe is me. No, woe not is you. Woe to God. He's the one that deserves our prayers. I mean, pray for him. I mean, God, for more patience. I don't know how you do it. How you put up with us. You give, you give, you give, you, you, you sin, you love, you, you watch over us, and we, and we live for you for a few days, and we spit in your face. I'm telling you, there's people listening to me tonight, and that's exactly what you do. You're nauseating to God, and for some only God knows reason, you're still living. And I'm going to tell you tonight, friend, when I give this altar call, get right and stay right. And let me tell you, why don't you be a blessing for a change? Why don't you quit being such a burden to the leadership of the church? When the leadership walks in, they wonder how you're doing today. Uh-oh, she's got a frown on again. She must be going through it again. So here you got to suck more life out of the pastor. When there's people in the church that really do have problems, your problems are because you've decided just to be wishy-washy. You've decided not to follow God, and so you're living in sin for a while, and yeah, the devil's got you all depressed and strung out. And so you're mully grub today. You're all bent out of shape. Young people, I want you to listen to me. I know there's hundreds over across the street, but there's hundreds in here too. Quit being like that. I said just quit being like that. Start living for God. Period. Make up your mind. You're going to live for God. You're not going to always walk in and hoping the youth pastor will come talk to you about something. And lift you up again. The pastor's always having to lift you up. That gets old, friend. I want to tell you why it's old. Because the church is on the grow. And this pastor who's added 300 new members, this man, this club owner, que Dios te bendiga, hermano, por lo que estás haciendo en Camden. Aleluya. Y hay más, hay mucho más, hermano. Dios va a usarte en una manera, un gran manera ahí. I'm mucho más. But the way God's using that brother in Camden, now he has 300 new members. He's got this club owner in his church. Could you imagine with all these new people that need fathering, they need shepherding for the old saints of the church that are all, you know, the long-faced. You know, how come he ain't spending no time with me? Because you've been saved for 18 years. You're supposed to be doing okay. You've been around the gospel all your life. You're supposed to be working for God, living for God, helping the pastor. He shouldn't have to walk in and see your long face. He should see a smile on your face and a rejoicing in your spirit. So if that's you tonight, friend, when I give this altar call, you get right and stay right. <clears throat> because if you don't, this revival is going to pass you by. You'll blink your eyes. I want to tell you, Brownsville, several years ago when this thing broke out, I can still see people today. They still come to the church every now and then, all long face, all bent, still wishy-washy in sin. The church has grown thousands of members. The youth group has grown hundreds and hundreds. And some of the wishy-washy kids from the beginning of the revival that are still sort of goofy, wishy-washy. Now there's 1,200 students in the Bible school, thousands in the church, and they're still, you're still sort of lost in this sea of sin, wondering what they're going to do. It's pitiful, friend. I said it's pitiful. And the revival will pass you by. I said it will pass you by, and you'll look down years ago, you'll wonder what happened to your life. It's your fault and nobody else's fault for not getting in.
It's your fault for not diving in and getting right with God and staying right with God. I'm speaking to you like this because I love you. I want everyone to pray with me right now. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. Everyone pray out loud. Everyone at home. And Janet, I want you to pray. I want everybody to pray right now. Dear Jesus, Jesus. speak to my heart. Speak to my heart. Change, my life. Change my life. In your precious name, precious name. Amen. amen. You may be seated for a minute or two. Let me tell you something else. Since we're on this, God, for some reason, has made us he, we are creatures of moods. How many here have experienced in your life different moods? Happy moods, sad moods. Let me tell you something about war. Although I have never fought in a physical military situation, my dad was a military man. My, my, my dad was a lieutenant. He was in the, he was in the army. And he trained folks how to use tanks. My dad was a military man, and he, we would sit down. We talked a lot about war. He saw a lot of his friends die. And one of the things he taught me about the military was get in, stand up, be a man, do your time. And my dad was always like that. Just, he was, if I fell down and hurt myself, some of you know what I'm talking about, where I'm heading with this. If I fell down and hurt myself, I remember one time I was playing on the swing set. Let me just go ahead and paint the picture for you. I was playing on the swing set. I was seven or eight years old. And I pulled myself up on the swing set, and there was a bolt holding the swing on, going through the top of the shaft there and holding the chain on. And I pulled myself up like a monkey, and I reached over, but I wasn't paying attention. I reached over too far. And then I slipped with this hand, and the bolt went right up inside my arm, and it ripped my arm wide open. And I hung there for about 60 seconds with the bolt in my arm, and it ripped it all the way across. There's a huge scar. Ripped it all the way across, and I fell to the ground, and it was an ugly war wound. I mean, my dad comes out. He goes, what's the matter, son? I went, hug, hug. <laughs> he goes, quit crying. If you quit crying, I'll get you an ice cream. <laughs> quit crying, you'll get me an ice cream. Folks, this thing was so ugly and so big. And so he said, come on, boy. He brought me in the bathroom, and he bought, got out a box of Johnson cotton balls. And he started sticking cotton balls all in that wound. <laughs> Stuffing them in there with his finger. Then he wrapped it with something. Who knows what it was? And they took me to the doctor. Well, the doctor spent the first hour with tweezers. <laughs> getting all the cotton out of my arm. Looking at my dad as he did it. But my dad was just one of those, you know, military men that just, you know, you ain't dead, son. And for those of you that every time you don't feel right, you're a pain to everybody else, would you stop that? If you wake up and things aren't going okay, tough. Don't make things not go okay for the rest of the band, okay? Get over it. I tell my staff, we've got a large staff in our ministry, I said, when you come to work, leave your problems at home. And our prayer team, I've told this prayer team, when they come here, they could be going through hell on earth, but people don't come from all over the world to hear about their dirty laundry or their hell on earth. People come from Scotland, New Zealand, Africa, Japan to be prayed for. And if they've had a bad day, tough. Pray for folks. It's called the army of God, friend. And if you're going to put up with a revival, if you're, going to, if you're going to make it in revival, if you're going to make it, you better start to learn to live like this. Standing up, 
Act like a man. Act like a woman. Be strong. God's speaking to a lot of people right now. I watch revival all the time. Pastors just spew people off. It just spits them off. They can't handle it. Wimps can't handle this, can't handle that. Let me go ahead and touch on something else. I'm going to, let me tell you, friend. Let me tell you something else about revival. Hear what this man said? This is a family man. This man owns this club. He said, I'm going to go with my pastor everywhere he goes. The pastor's traveling, preaching the word. It's called a move of God. It's called the war. It's called the war breaking out. You, all the training of our lives has been for times like this. This is a time to run. This is a time to do the work of the ministry. This is a time to burn the candle on both ends. This is time to put in 80 hour weeks without complaining. But I watch people, and this is gonna hurt some feelings, and go ahead and get hurt. I watch people, they get in revival, and their little boy can't play baseball no more. Or their daughter can't be on the swim team no more. They can't come to Friday night meeting because they, they, they were involved in a bowling league. They don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. Friend, let me tell you, the revival will spew you out. Revival will spew you out. Why? You ain't going to pay no price. I want to tell you, the military do the same thing to you. When war broke out, you better not have your mind back on the home front. You better have it on the front lines. This is revival. So if you want revival, Pastor, to break out in your church, you let them know it's going to cost them everything. My children, I love my children. They're in revival every single night. My boy is a great baseball player, a great soccer player. He hasn't seen a baseball or a soccer ball in, a, in three years. And he was a star player. Why? I still believe in soccer and baseball. But if baseball is going to be on Thursday night, my son is not going to be off somewhere playing soccer or baseball. While the world, three million people are flooding through a church, he's not going to be out on some field learning how to swing a bat when the power of God is coming down. And then years down the road, when someone asks him about the Brownsville revival, he says, well, we went every now and then. You went every now and then? The revival, that ignited revival around the world? You went, what did you do? What, did you have prayer meetings at home? Is that why you didn't go? Were you holding special? You were out evangelizing, right? Instead of going on Thursday night, you went out evangelizing, hit the streets, preaching the gospel. No, no. What did you do? Baseball. You played baseball? while the power was coming down in the church? You played baseball? Think about it, friend. I want this to get into your system. It'll cost you everything. Revival will cost you everything. It'll cost you your energy. Your family will be sucked right into it. Let me tell you something else. If you've got high ambitions for your kids to be doctors and lawyers and this and that, that's all fine and dandy. But beware of revival. Because when revival breaks out, suddenly your Yale-bound kid or your Harvard-bound kid is going to say, Daddy, something's going on inside of me, and I want to go to the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. It'll cost you everything. It'll cost you your family. Praise God. I'm telling you the truth. It's time for you to count the costs. Well, hmm, that didn't take long. Did we pray? Maybe we need to pray again. I've just been raised around, I've been, I've been fortunate to be raised around men of God. And I remember in Argentina when I was looking for a pastor to come help me pastor a church in Nail Ken. I'm an evangelist, we're church planters. And we're going to southern Argentina to plant this church. A man came up to me who was mightily used in miracles, signs, and wonders. Mightily used in miracles, signs. I mean, he could attract 10,000 people just like that. 
miracles. He came up to me and said, Steve, I'll give you two years of my life in that church. I'll give you two years. I'll help you start the church. I remember looking at him and I went, two years? You're going to give me two years of your life. Then what? What does the church do after two years? After you've, after you've come in and you've caused all this commotion and thousands of people have come through, then what do we do? Try to find a follow-up pastor for you? I'm not interested, I said to him. If you're going to come in and plant a church with me, you're going to come in and plant a church and you're going to stay there. And you're going to follow through. I'm saying this to some evangelists here. Some of you evangelists are fly-by-nighters. You don't stick with nothing. You don't pay a price. As soon as you run out of sermons, you're ready to leave. Just as a church, maybe it's seven weeks, maybe it's seven months in revival, but you're getting all tired out. And you want to go somewhere else so you don't have to prepare messages anymore. You can use your old messages. You're a wimp, friend. Why don't you stick in there with the pastor? Why don't you pay the price with the pastor? Why don't you get in there and get on the streets? Talk to people about Jesus. Help grow the church. Do some work. Get your hands dirty. Bust some rocks. Get involved. So instead of getting this one evangelist, I got Hector. Hector, many of you know him. Hector Ferreira. He comes to this revival. We planted the church in 1986. Here it is, 1998. He's still there. The church has got about 10,000 members. Members. And it's plant, the church has planted at least 20 churches. At least 20 churches. You see the difference? Fruit that remains. Fruit that remains. And it's so easy to go with the, the glory and the glitter and the glamour. Whew. Go for the hard work. It'll last. Amen. Well, this won't take long. I want to read some scriptures to you. Philippians 4.8 says this. This message is entitled, Yap, Yap, Yap. <laughs> and I mean that. I'm really sick of a lot of talk. A lot of hot air out there. A lot of people just yapping along. Philippians 4.8, I'm going to give you several scriptures. You can write them down, read them, whatever you want to do with them, friend. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Part of the reason many of you in this room, you walk around with a long face, is because you're not fulfilling Scripture. I concentrate on the positive. I said I concentrate on the positive. I concentrate on the churches in Camden. When I go to sleep at night, I think about what happened with them. I don't concentrate on disgruntled church members. I concentrate on the positive. Whatsoever things are of a good report. I'm losing them, Pastor. Anybody with me? Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, say new man, new man. which after God is created in righteousness and truth and holiness. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Ephesians 5, 4, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, say that with me, nor foolish talking, say that again, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. 2 Timothy, this was a warning from Paul to Timothy, 2, 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now, there's a lot of other scriptures, but I'm going to read one out of John, and then I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes. John chapter 12. This is Jesus. Father, 
glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. John 12, 28. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. This is Jesus. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. That was pitiful. I was weak, friend. Let me tell you. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, and we're going to talk for a few minutes about, yep, 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 friend, everything but Jesus is being lifted up. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Let me explain something to you today. Let me explain something to you today. Now you can say, well, he was talking about the crucifixion. Of course he was, friend. He was going to be lifted up to Calvary. He's going to be nailed and then put on a, put on a, he was going to be put on a beam and held up in front of everybody. But talking about that is what he was talking about. You go, see, Jesus preached a lot of messages. You'll see him preaching to a crowd of thousands, multitudes. And what did he do? He fed them food. Great things happen. I mean, miracles of food. But a few months later, down the road, here's Peter. Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. What's he talking about? He's talking about the cross. He's talking about Jesus. And there's thousands of people listening. And he's lifting up Jesus. He knows that if Jesus is lifted up, he will draw all men into himself. And he lifts up Jesus. And what happens? Keep in mind, Pastor Peter did not lift up manifestations. They were drunken, speaking in other tongues, doesn't even talk about them. Just mentions briefly that this is what was prophesied in Joel. But what he talks about, friend, is Christ, this one who you have crucified. He lifts Jesus up, and then what happens? He draws all men unto himself, and they say, My God, what must we do to be saved? Well, I woke up this morning with only one thing on my mind. Now, to have one thing on your mind in today's world is a miracle. You hear me? I've learned a, lot, a valuable lesson in life, friend. I've learned the importance of not clouding my head with senseless issues and things that I can't do anything about. I remember I was invited to speak. I turned down invitations and will continue to do so the rest of my life. If you only knew the invitations, we turn down all the time. Major venues, we just turn them down. See, we want you to speak with so-and-so. We want you to do this. We want you to do that. Turn them down. It's so easy for me to turn stuff down because if God's not telling me to do it, I ain't going to do it. But I remember I was spoken. They invited me to come and speak to, at the Pentecostal World Conference in Oslo, Norway. And that was a big thing for me because Joe and everybody was going to be there and I was going to speak to them. I was going to be one of the head speakers at the Oslo conference. And this was back in 1992. And I was all excited about it, that I was going to be a speaker. And they said, all expenses paid, flying in there with my wife. It was going to be a big thing. The World Pentecostal World Conference. And I was walking along the beaches in the Mediterranean in Spain. We were planning a church and the Lord spoke to me through the psalmist. He said this, and I want everyone to hear me. Psalm 131 says this, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself. When I read that, and I read it in three or four different translations, one of the translations says, I will not involve myself in things too difficult for me. I will not involve, another translation says, I will not involve myself in things too marvelous for me. And I looked at that Pentecostal World Conference and I thought, I have no business speaking at that conference. I'm a church planter. I am a church planter. My business is in Spain, planting a church. And I was walking along the beach talking to God about it. 
And the Lord spoke to me. He said, Steve, all you're going to do at that conference is fill your head with big names. That's all you're going to do. And suddenly you're going to know all these major players all over the world. And they're going to invite you to do this, do that, do this, do that. And that's not my plan for you, Steve. And I would imagine, friend, if I'd gone to the World Conference, I'd never be in Brownsville right now. I would have not gone to Brownsville. Because I went from Spain back to the States and went straight to Russia to plant churches. I would have never done that if I'd gone to the World Conference. I'd be doing little conferences all over the nations. I know that's what I would have done. How to do this and how to do that. How to do this and how to do that. But I didn't involve myself in things too lofty. So I've learned, friend, to keep things simple. Well, everybody's talking. Everybody's yapping. Let me just give you a scenario of what's going on right now. And some of you are so full of this, you need to get it out of your system. Everybody's yapping about something these days. Now, some of the subjects I'm going to bring up, I know nothing about because I don't keep up with them. But I have a research department with my ministry, and they keep me up with what I want to stay up on. And this morning, we worked on this. On everybody's minds and lips, these are breaking stories, Monica and Bill. Is he guilty? Did he lie? Did she lie? Should he be impeached? Friend, think about the energy. Could you imagine if America read their Bible as much as they talk about Monica and Bill? We would have revival in a heartbeat. Did you hear about Linda Tripp? What about Ken Starr? What does this mean for the presidency, the press, the nation? Or then they talk about the bombings in Kenya. They're the talk of the nation. Who's responsible for this terrorist attack against the United States? The bombings killed 257 people, 12 of which were Americans. There's five suspects in custody. The actions have been denounced by the President and the United Nations. That's another talk of the town. Earlier this week, two earthquakes struck California. This week, the greater of this region was 5.6 on the Richter scale. No one was injured. And no serious damage was reporting, but I promise you, there's all kinds of aftershocks. People are talking. Beginning last week, here we go, friend, the stock market took a dive. It dropped 500 points. Many analysts believe that this is the beginning of the Asian crisis, that it's the effects of the Asian crisis has finally reached the United States, and we're going to have a horrible last quarter this year. Here we go. What about the Capitol shooting three weeks ago? People still want to talk about that lone gunman, Rusty Weston, who killed the two security officers in the nation's capital. Folks, I want you to look at me. Breaking stories are happening all the time. We were going to be on the front cover of Time magazine a year ago. They're still going to put the story out, front cover. Princess Di dies. Remember that? That was our cover. <laughs> That was our cover. I got a call the next day and said, Steve, we're going to have to bump you. <laughs> I said, I don't care, man, whatever. You know, it doesn't matter if you bump us. But, you know, Princess Di, she gets, she gets the coverage. There's always a breaking story. There's always something to yap about. You're not getting it yet. I can feel this. Here's a big rave today. Here we go. Everybody's talking about gays. This is this week's Newsweek, Gay for Life. This is a couple right here. She was a lesbian. He was a transvestite. He, matter of fact, he won, a, he won. He's got a picture in here of when he won a beauty contest dressed up as a woman. And uh, now they've both gotten saved. They're both on fire for God, and they're married, and they have a kid. But let me tell you, this new controversy that's coming out of these ads in all these major magazines, USA Today, the New York Times, big ads saying that you can come out of the closet, you can come out of that lifestyle, you can get totally free through Jesus Christ. It's causing no small stir in the world. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's talking about the big problem with the year 2000, the computer crisis. How many have heard of that? I've had, they're going to solve it, friend, and you know it. How many know they're going to solve it? Yeah, right, yeah, the whole thing's going to go down the tubes. Right. 
Everybody's got an opinion. And they'll spend hours talking about it. What do you think needs to be done? I don't know. Let's form a committee. There's always going to be some economic disaster to talk about. We've been talking about economic disaster, friend, for 30 years. How many are with me? You remember Will Willard Cantalone's book, The Day the Dollar Dies? I mean, that was back in the early 70s. There's, it's always going to, we're always going to die. Something's always going to happen. Oh, no, whoa, oh, oh, build a bomb shelter. Do something. Help us, help us. Store your money in a coffee can in the backyard. Help us, help us. Put canned food in there. Whatever. There's never an end to it, friend. Yap, 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 yap. We're always talking, 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 and nobody's getting anywhere. Well, why don't we talk about Beanie Babies? <laughs> Lord have mercy. I went into an antique shop the other day and one corner of the whole antique shop, it was huge, Beanie Babies. I'm going, wait a minute. Don't you take these little stuffed critters and put them in an antique shop. Well, these are original Beanie Babies, you know? These are old Beanie Babies. There's no such thing as an old Beanie Baby. <laughs> these are collector Beanie Babies. Well, they've replaced Nano Babies as the hottest toy in the market. And maybe you have heard about the Teletubbies, the new British children TV stars that are taking America by storm. If you haven't, good. And let's talk about school, young people. Here we go. We got school. The summer is winding up. It's the talk of the fall fashion, school clothes, and everybody's wondering what they're going to wear. I'm talking about, friend, it eats me alive, man. Here, here you go. You got to go to school. You got those with you? Bring those, bring those shoes out here. Here we go. You're at the mall, sis. You're 16 years old. You're heading into your junior year. And you can't make up your mind which shoes to get. Friend, it is tough. I, I, I pray for you. You go. And I'm being kind, trust me. We could have picked out some others, but we're being very conservative here. But you walk up. I'm not going to tell you the price. These are expensive shoes, man, for what they look like. <laughs> this is made of grass. That's grass. That's all that is. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. That's weeds. <laughs> weeds and cork. Genuine cork. But you go into a mall and you just can't make up your mind. You've spent hours at McDonald's flipping burgers so you can buy a pair of platforms. And you walk and you go, oh my God, Jesus, help me. I don't know, Lord. No. Speak to me, Jesus. Are these the ones? I don't want to miss you, God. Trust me, friend. You ain't going to miss them. You're laughing, but man, it's going on everywhere. It's going on everywhere. I wouldn't show up unless I had the latest Nikes and New Balance. Everybody's talking about Tommy Hilfiger, and some even talk about Echo Unlimited clothes. You name it, friend, they're out there wondering what is going to look right on that first day of school. Who cares? By the way, who wears, this is a size 10 medium. Who wears a 10 medium, girls? Will you wear these? Come here, come get them. There you go. You are welcome. I like your style, sis. She goes, others are going, I got to raise my hand, I got to raise my hand. She goes, 
I'm not cutting down shoes, friend. I'm not cutting. You didn't hear me cut down these things. I'm talking about, yep, 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 yep. I mean, we spend more time on frivolous, insignificant, senseless, jabbering. Who wears eight medium? <laughs> Will you wear them? You promise? I'm going to throw them to you. Now catch them. That's one. Now they're going to go back and testify at the church <laughs> that they came to the Brownsville Revival and they prayed, God, if you're really there, if you're really there, have the evangelist bring out a pair of platform shoes my size. As a matter of fact, friend, this blew my mind. Oh, did you hear about, how many know about El Nino? How many know about La Nina? Whoa, one store falling. El Nino, the brother, now here comes La Nina. There's no end, friend, in sight for everything. You want to talk about the weather? We're going to have weather, okay? How many believe we're going to have weather? It's nice we're having weather. It's going to come or go whether you talk about it or not. Why don't you move on to higher things? So today, my staff member brings into me this magazine. And it's called, this article is called The Buzz Machine. This is Newsweek, The Buzz Machine. You know what it's about? It's about all the yapping going on. This was after I got my message. It's about all the talking going on in America. And it names all the people that are causing all the talk. It lists everyone and what they talk about and why they talk about it and what their future subjects are going to be. It talks about talking. America loves to yap about nothing. We'll talk, 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 talk until we burn in hell. Well, we're going to turn that around for the next couple minutes. Tonight, the scripture says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Now tonight, Jesus, friend and I'm gonna do this quick tonight but you better get to the place where Jesus is your consuming passion he's everything to you bring me out that poster bro. I just I'm just in an illustration mood you know but remember those moods we talked about I'm in an illustrated mood and so I got a little sign last night I talked about what tonight I want to talk about I want to talk about Jesus Lift him up! 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 He's here! He's here! He's here! Well. Better get used to it, friend. I'm going to talk about it for a few minutes. I've got three quick points, and then Charity's going to sing. My first one is this. I'm going to lift him up so you can see him from the pit of despair. I'm going to talk about three locations. So you can see him from the pit of despair. There is a place. You might call it wit's end. You might call it the end of your rope. You can call it rock bottom. You can call it anything you want, but there's people within the sound of my voice, there's people listening from internet, there's people listening on the radio and at home. You are at the very bottom. Let me tell you something about a pit. The Bible talks about a pit. I waited patiently for the Lord, David said, and he inclined unto me and he heard my cry. This is Psalm 40. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. It's not just a pit, it's a horrible pit.
out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock and established my goings, and he has put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Let me tell you, friend, 23 years ago, I was at the very bottom of a pit. I had sunken in the miry clay through drug addiction, alcoholism, rebellion. I was at the very bottom. Is anybody listening? I hope so, friend, because there's a lot of folks here tonight that are just like that. I was at the very bottom. There was no way out. The walls of this pit were slimy. It was impossible to crawl out on my own. I could see nothing but darkness. I could see above me light, but there's no way to get to it. You know, you always see hope out there somewhere. Somebody's doing something right, but you can't seem to attain it. You can't seem to get it. And it's one horrible feeling to claw at the sides of a pit trying to get out, knowing that there's hope somewhere out there. Well, a Lutheran minister one day came over to my house, and I thank God. We just did a television broadcast yesterday about this, and it was so refreshing to talk to him after 23 years. I thank God that he did not come over to my house, Rudy, and stand by the pit and say, Steve, can you hear me? Yes, I need help down here. Steve, let me tell you about what's going on in Washington. Did you know that Nixon has resigned the presidency and Ford has taken over and it looks like they're grooming Carter for the White House? No, I didn't know about that and I really don't care about that. This is where we're at though, friend. We live on the moon. People are dying. People are prostitutes across the street. They're in jail crying out. And we want to talk about El Nino. We want to talk about the weather. We want to talk about what kind of jeans they have on. Forget it, friend. They want to hear about Jesus. They want to hear about Jesus. They want to hear about Jesus. You know what he did? I'm telling you. I want you to see him from the pit of despair. Here's what the man did, the Lutheran minister. He said, Steve, I want you to see something. Look up. And he walked over to the top of the pit and he went, read this. And I looked up. And I went, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The Bible says, if he is lifted up, he will draw all men into him. And I began saying his name, Jesus. And the more I said his name, the higher I got in the pit, I began to rise. Jesus, 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 Jesus. He brought me out of the Mary clay. He set my feet. For those of you that are down in the dumps, Jesus has been there. He can pull you out. And the only one, I'm gonna, I can talk all night long about stuff. We're not here to talk about stuff, we're here to talk about Jesus. You listen well. He pulled me up out of the pit of despair. But there's another place. There is another place. And I'm going to call it... I want to lift him up so you can see him from the pinnacle of success. There's many people within the sound of my voice 
that you're not in the pit of despair. You're up there lofty. And if I had me a pole, I could do something with this. Is there anybody here with a pole? Some type of long? Yeah. You got a pole? Bring it over here, man. That's perfect. Man. Was in your back pocket? Man, the stuff people bring to revival. This is awesome. This is awesome. What can I do with this? You know, I think this is perfect. Well, God's with you, son. I need to attach this somehow. If I had some duct tape, I could attach it right here. Anybody got any duct tape? Yeah. You got a roll? Man alive! Shoo-wee! Anybody got some scissors? You got some scissors? Bear with me just for a second here. I love revival. The Lord provides. Next time you bring duct tape, man, take the wrapper off, would you? <laughs> Folks, about 99% of what we do is spontaneous. I mean, it just, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But, but it's to get a point across. And, uh, man, this stuff. Bring Lyndall out here, sing a chorus. Yeah. <laughs> Next time you bring a roll of duct tape, take the wrapper off and start it for me, would you? <laughs> here we go. I'm just going to tear this stuff. <laughs> How are those shoes? They fit? It's awesome, isn't it? Let me tell you something, sisters. There's nothing special about them, okay? They're not holy shoes. All right. <laughs> people are uh, people are funny. About stuff like that. Can I touch your shoes? I think that'll do it. Let me tell you something, friend. There are, there are some people, there are some people that are in the pit of despair. But there are others who are so lofty. They're so lofty, they're way on up there. I want you to hear me and I want you to hear me good. You're a doctor in the house. You're a lawyer in the house. Jesus, you just don't know, you, you can't fathom him. He just, he doesn't make sense to you. Man, when, it, when the boy brings a pole, he brings a pole, doesn't he? But this is for those of you who are way up there. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, 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 if I be lifted up. Let me tell you something, friend. It makes no difference to me if you're the top lawyer in the nation. You're way up there. You're not down in the pits with David or Steve. You're way up in the nation. You're up at the top of the corporate world. You've climbed the ladder to the very tippity top. You don't need Jesus. Well, let me tell you something, friend. You need Jesus like nobody's business. And he's come up to your level tonight. He's up high. He's up high for you tonight, friend. I remember sitting right out there when I used to sit in. A doctor, a doctor was sitting out there. You know, when people talk about Jesus, they say, well, you know, the drug addicts and prostitutes, they need God. 
They really need God. But there's a doctor sitting right here, an eye surgeon. Jesus was lifted up in the meeting. And the man looked up. And he saw him high and lifted up. He saw the crucifixion. And he was broken in his spirit. This man's one of the top surgeons in the nation, a master surgeon. He, fixed crushed, he fixes crushed eyes after automobile accidents and things. He's sitting there and he begins to break under the power of God. Falls under conviction and he realizes he doesn't know the Lord. He's away from God. He's left the God of his childhood. He's made it all the way to the top of the medical profession. And I'm going to tell you something, friend. If I had come in here that night and I just talked to the lowly, if I just talked to those who are base and those who are on drugs and all that, man, it would have gone straight past him right over his head. And he said, he would have said, I'm not like that. But we came in here and want to know what we did? We lifted up Jesus. We lifted him up, friend. And when he is lifted up, the Bible says he will draw all men unto himself. Is that the Bible? Boy. Oh. Man, I was at the revival and Jesus fell on me. Man, it's just, he fell on me. I mean, you, you mean you felt it? Yeah, I felt it. Huh? He's got on a Superman t shirt. <laughs> Friend, everybody stand with me. Rudy, just hold this. Just like that, just hold it straight up. The pit of despair, the pinnacle of success. I'm talking about all the way to the White House. If Jesus is lifted up, if Jesus lifted up, we get a chance, this, this revival group right here, we get chances, opportunities, and more and more are coming to talk to hierarchy. It's awesome. If we told you the people that we've talked to, many of you would say, I don't believe that. The media would be shocked if they knew who we talked to. Because this revival spread all over the world. And we get opportunities to talk to people all the time. People of importance. But now more and more key figures in the world God's opening the doors for us to talk to them face to face. I want to tell you something. When we talk to them, we don't bring up Monica and Bill. When we talk to them, we don't talk about El Nino. We don't talk to them about the latest Nikes or Tommy Hilfiger or anything else. When you talk to when you have an opportunity to talk to somebody, friend, there be, needs to be one thing on your mind. Lift him up. Lift him up. Everybody else is yapping. And if you start yapping with everybody else, you're going to get caught in that quagmire. You're going to get caught in that, that, that filthy, dirty smut of the world. That's why the Bible continually talked about. Speak about heavenly things. Lift up your head. Talk about other things. Quit the foolish talking. Not only the high and lofty, but tonight I'm going to lift him up so you can see him from every place in between. The low the high, and everywhere in between. Wherever you're at tonight, friend, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, I want you to fasten your eyes on Jesus. Doctor, take your eyes off the x-ray negative and look at the one who sees you through and through. Nurse, fold up your stethoscope for a moment. Stuff it in your pocket. Hang it around your neck and focus on the one that heard your heartbeat before you were born. Teacher, put up the biology book for a moment and focus on the one who put the whole world together. Professor, put up your chalk, turn off the overhead, and look to the one who is overhead. Policeman, flip off your siren. Put up your ticket book and focus for a few minutes on the one who has everyone's unseen violations written down. Judge, 
lay down your gavel, slip off your robe, and humble yourself before the one who stands high above the United States Supreme Court. Recognize the one that when he enters the room, all hell rises to its feet. And he says, I promise to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me me. Can we just, just for a few minutes and close? Jesus, Joshua said, you're the captain of the host of the Lord. The psalmist said, you're the lifter of my head. He also said, you're my strong rock. He said, you're the chiefest among 10,000s, the Song of Solomon. The Bible says in Isaiah, he's a nail fastened in a sure place. Isaiah said, he's a shadow from the heat. He's a God of the whole earth. He's a king over the earth. He is a friend of sinners, Matthew said. He's a bridegroom. He's a door of the sheep, John said. He's a judge of the living and the dead. He's the image of the invisible God. He's a head of the body. He's a blessed and only potentate. Say potentate. You don't hear that much anymore. Let me tell you what a potentate is. You know what potent is? Strong, powerful. Well, a potentate is someone who exercises strong, controlling power. And 1 Timothy 6.15 said he is a blessed and only potentate. He is the author of eternal salvation. He's our intercessor. He's the one that shall come, the Bible says in Hebrews. He's my helper. He's the advocate. He's the lamb in the midst of the throne, Revelation 7. Is anybody with me tonight? There's so much here, friend, I love this. He is the great physician. Lift him up. I tell you, if you can do that, and bring him back down and lift him all the way up. Bring up them poles. He's the great physician. He's the comforter. He's the light. He's the teacher. To the architect, he's the chief cornerstone. To the banker, he's the hidden treasure. I'm gonna wait on you, buddy. Still don't get it, do you? That's high enough. If we can't get it high enough, then we'll get these girls with the platform shoes to. save your soul. He's the one that can forgive you. He's the one that can wash you. I'm sick and tired of the yap, yap, yapping. All the talking that's going on. Friend, you can go to marriage counselor after marriage counselor. Until you go to that counselor, you're wasting your time. Rudy, I think I'm just going to have you hold it for the next several hours. I like it. You can bring it down. I want everyone with the chairs moving to the left and the right.
Charity, come join me, sis. I often wonder, everyone else remains standing. The other night, a man testified that he was here at the revival, and during this time, he snuck out and went to the bathroom. He's under conviction. And in the bathroom, we have speakers. He could not believe it, because he got out of here to get away from this, and he goes into the bathroom, and it's as live as live can be. He gets so right with God. He's so on fire. Let me tell you something, friend. God's in this place. He's here to wash you. He's here to cleanse you. He's here to make you brand new. But I issued a warning at the beginning of this meeting. Just a few minutes ago, I issued a warning to you. I said, for those of you that are away from God, you're messing around, I said, get right with God tonight. I told you to do that. Now, this evangelist, I'm going to get dead serious with you. I have been all night, but I want you to listen. Everybody, don't let anybody distract you. Charity's going to sing a song called Mercy Seat. Before she sings that, I feel so strong tonight. So I want to tell you what the devil hates. The devil hates that name. He hates him with a passion. And when Jesus Christ is lifted up, y'all looking for somebody? Him? You got some folks looking for you, buddy. You know her? When Jesus Christ is lifted up, the devil hates it. Look this way first. He hates it. You can talk about the Brownsville Revival and the devil twiddles his thumbs. You talk about Steve Hill and John Kilpatrick, Lyndall Cooley, John Davis, any of us up here? The devil go to sleep. He'll go to sleep. Oh, he knows who we are, but he knows also that we're nothing without Jesus. When you start talking about Jesus, it stirs hell. That's why I can stand up and talk about Harley Davidson's. I can talk about basketball and football. The devil could care less. But the power comes when I start mentioning the name Jesus. That's when he recognizes me. He sees the authority because I'm living holy. Now I'm using his name. And the devil's never been able to handle that. Here's what's going to happen right now, friend. I want everyone to listen. If you're in this place, now in a few minutes I'm going to bind the devil. That's what I was getting to. I'm going to bind him. I'm going to bind him. I'm going to shackle him. But he's got a lot of you shackled here. So I'm going to bind him and the shackle is going to come loose. And you're going to come down to this altar. But you're going to have a split second, just a few seconds to come down here and get right with God. Because this is spiritual warfare. And the devil knows whether or not you're responding. He knows what's going on. He knows whether or not you want Jesus. I want you to listen to me. If you're in this place and you're doing things that Jesus would never do, or at home, you're listening by radio, you're doing things that Jesus would never do. Look this way, folks. Don't be distracted. You can sit in front of a TV set and watch trash. You need to hit these altars in a minute. I'm shooting straight with you, friend. Are you telling me, Steve, that you don't watch trash? Yeah. We live holy lives. Did you know that you can do that? You can live a holy life. Don't you go to the beach? Oh, we'll go to the beach, but we don't go to the beach where anybody else is at. We go to private areas. And sometimes you have to drive to find a place nobody wants. That's where I take my family. Why? I don't want my family hanging around flesh. I don't want things dancing in front of me. I want my eyes pure. I want to be able to look out at God's creation without some abstraction in front of it. So yeah, you can keep yourself holy. You can keep yourself holy. You really, really can. But there's a lot of people within the sound of my voice, you're not. Maybe at one time you knew the Lord, but now you've backslidden. Maybe at one time you lifted up Jesus. He was really something in your life. Maybe you got proud and haughty. I've seen this with pastors and evangelists. They become hot shots. Big, big wheelers. You know, they're starting to be used of God. Suddenly their name is everywhere. You know, 
They love to be called by name. You know? And then you hear less about Jesus in their life and more about them. Next news you know, they're cold, they're dry. Oh, they still got their routine, but they've lost out with God. The problem is a lot of churches still have the evangelists in because they've lost out with God too. They can't tell the difference. So there's some folks here within my, there's some ministries here, ministers here. You've allowed sin to creep into your life. You've lost the touch of God. You're just doing the same old, same old. You're going to repent tonight, get right with God, get back to your first love, who is Jesus. He's everything. He's the one that's coming back. This is the one that's coming back. He's the only one that you're going to have to do with. He's the only one that you're going to have to stand before. You're not going to have to stand before the assemblies of God. You're not going to have to stand before the Southern Baptist Convention. You're going to stand before Jesus. Sister, always remember that. I'm from Huntsville. You know that. I want a move of God in North Alabama. And God's going to use the Baptist mightily. But you're not going to have to stand before the Southern Baptist. You're going to stand before God. When he pours out his spirit, you quench that. That's a black mark on heaven's chalkboard. So when some folks come up and say, what's all this stuff going on? Hey, boy, don't you bow your head. Look them straight in the eye and say, let me tell you some testimonies. Let me tell you about my son. Let me tell you about this person. Let me tell you about that person. You let them know. Don't you back down to nobody. Because he's the one you're going to give an account to, not man. There's some people here, you have fallen. You're going to get right with God in just a minute. You've backslid, you've slid away from God. Others in this room, you've never known the Lord. You've never known him. Maybe you're the one in the pit of despair. And my illustration tonight made sense to you. I was in the pit of despair and drug addiction, alcoholism. All I needed was Jesus. I need Jesus to lift me out. Nobody else. And that Lutheran vicar knew that. The Lutheran vicar didn't say, Steve, if you'll come to church this Sunday and listen to me preach, maybe God will do something. I'd have never showed up at his church. I was in the pit. That's where I lived in that pit. And he was right there by my, my, me. That man came to my house and he held Jesus right over the top of the pit. And I'm doing that for you tonight. If you've never known the Lord, he'll bring you out. Last night, a lady came up to me right here. I'm sure you're still here, son. Introduced me to her brother, who a week ago was delivered from drugs here. One week ago was delivered from drugs right here. And he, man, he started talking to me, and he could not stop the emotion coming out of him. See, when you've been set free for a week, it's like 10 years if you've been on drugs. A week being clean is unheard of. So he's been clean for a week, and he's just bubbling, just alive. Jesus will do that for you tonight. No matter where you're at, friend, he'll set you free. We've lifted him up tonight. He's everything. He was the one who paid the price on Calvary for you. Not your pastor, not the deacon, not the evangelist. Jesus Christ, and he's the one that can set you free. And those of you in this room, and within the sound of my voice, that are religious but you don't know the Lord, there's a host of people here tonight. You're religious. That means you hang around the cross. You love hanging around Jesus. It's cool. But you don't know him. Friend, you're as bad off as a junkie on the street. The saddest day is going to be the day of the rapture. If it happens on a Sunday morning, could you imagine the chaos when people turn to one another and they say, they see this one man disappear, a lady over here disappear, an associate pastor disappear. The pastor stays. Very well could happen. A few choir members disappear, and people start turning to one another and they go, You? I thought you knew him. And they go, I thought you knew him. And they start looking around. Going, my God, what is this? It's called religion. It's called religion. And I preached a message one night entitled, The Shock of Our Lives. It's going to be on that day when people think. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord, I worked wonders in your name. I prophesied I healed the sick. The Bible didn't say that they tried to. The Bible said they did. 
And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You were never intimate with me. I was never Lord over you. You were a maverick. You did everything on your own. Depart from me. Friend, I'm warning you tonight. If you're religious, it'll damn you. Religion's hanging around the cross. Christianity's getting on the cross. You know what's amazing? We preach this message in coliseums all over this nation. Many of you have not been to an Awake America. But we'll go to an Awake America in a week or so. We're in an coliseum of 14,000 people. We've been in 17, 18,000 seat coliseums. And to look around, as far as the eye can see, just people. And they line, they circle the auditoriums all day long in the hot sun to get in. And they get in all walks of life. It's amazing to see the response when Jesus is lifted up. From the backslider to the people who have never known the Lord to the religious. And I remember in Dallas, Texas, in the Dallas Reunion Arena in downtown Dallas, the biggest auditorium there, we watched as the floor flooded, thousands of people ran. The first man to come running was a Baptist pastor. One of the top Baptist pastors in the city had his badge on, came running to the altars, fell on his face in front of everybody. And about 5,000 people joined him on their face, weeping and wailing. What are they doing? A lot of those people are religious people, but they don't know the Lord. And they're asking God to forgive them for playing such an idiotic game, thinking that everything was okay. Friend, let me tell you, the true test of your soul is when you're alone with God. That means when you're in a closet by yourself, that's who you are. That's who you are. And if I ask many of you to crawl into some closet here in this church and stand there in the dark, you would stand there like this and have nothing to say. If you were in love with Jesus, you'd go say, Jesus, Steve asked me to come in the closet. Here we are. I've been talking to you all day long, but I just want to continue the conversation. You know, I love you with all my heart, Jesus. Here we are in the dark together. I love you. But a lot of you that call yourself Christians would stand in that closet and he'd be a million miles away. Why? You don't know it. That's a true test of a man's soul is when they're alone. And so if you're religious, remember, I'm warning you, you can go to hell with baptismal waters dripping off your face. You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer stuck to your tongue. You can go to hell, friend, with a certificate of ordination hanging behind your, hanging behind your desk. You can go to hell with a certificate of perfect Sunday school attendance for 1997 and you're working on 1998 and go to hell if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know this one right here. Charity's going to sing Mercy Seat. When she sings Mercy Seat, if you need forgiveness, you're going to come quickly. You're going to come quickly. And by the way, you won't be alone. Hundreds will come. No, we're not going to close our eyes. No, we're not going to lift our hands. I want to tell you why. Calvary was not like that. Jesus was not crucified in a cave somewhere in the dark. He was crucified on top of Mount Calvary for everyone to gawk at. And this business of secretly coming to Jesus in some back room somewhere, not telling anybody about it, that's pride. If you think you're going to go back to some hotel room and talk to Jesus because you're convicted tonight, friend, that's pride. Pride will damn you. Pride is what casts Lucifer out of heaven. Tonight, we've lifted Jesus high. Tonight, get the pride out of your life. Remember, he went all the way to Calvary for you. If you're sitting in your life, the least you can do is come all the way to the altar for him. I'm going to bind the devil. And if there's sin in your life, if you need forgiveness tonight, you're going to come quickly. Do not hesitate. When charity begins to sing, that's your cue to come. I'm going to bind the devil, and when I do, the shackle's going to come off your leg. If you know you're supposed to be down here, that shackle's going to come off. That hesitation, should I come, should, shake it off. I'm going to bind the devil. That shackle's going to come undone, and you come down quickly. If you don't, and you know there's sin there, if you don't, you might as well stop, pray to the devil, and say, devil, I don't want Jesus. I want you. You might as well, because that's what you're doing.
It's as crystal clear, friend. It's spiritual warfare. It's not flesh and blood. It's a spirit warfare. And the devil sees and the Lord sees. So make the right decision in the balcony, at home, in this main floor. Satan, hear me and hear me good. Tonight, I have lifted up that five-letter name that causes you and your demons to tremble. I have lifted up Jesus, and in the authority that's invested in that name, I bind you. I bind you. I bind you from every man, woman, and child in this room. Now, Satan, loose her, loose him, and let him go. Now, come, friend, if you're coming, come right now. Hurry, 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 hurry. Run, hurry. In the darkness where everything come on. is unknown. God bless you, sis. Come on, Neil, right here at the altar. I face the power Let's go. of sin on my Let's go. I did not know of a place I could go where I could find a way to heal my wounded soul. Come on. He's Come on. We've lifted up Jesus. We've lifted up his name. There is no name, no name under heaven whereby you can be saved outside the name Jesus. He is the only way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man goes to the Father but through me. Tonight, on your knees, right now, get on your knees and say, Jesus, wash me, cleanse me, make me new. Quit yapping about this and yapping about that. Get right with God. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. He's drawing you right now, friend. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hurry. Hurry. Come true. Turn around. But I know where yes. there's a place of mercy for come you. Come on.